to see all of you here this morning uh, to worship our God. He has called us here this morning. And so let's gather our hearts, find our seats, and let us lift up our voice and begin worshiping our God this morning by singing our far, first song together, This I Believe. see all of you beautiful people here to worship together. Um, June is a time of tremendous celebration. I was at a graduation party last night. My son graduates this Thursday. Um, I know we had some seminary students graduate last weekend. It's a lot of anticipation for things to come, the next stage of life. But also for me, this past in the last eight days, I received notice of two of my very close friends that have been diagnosed with cancer. And they're right around my age. I, I consider myself to be pretty young. They're around my age. Um, and just like that, their entire lives, not just 
the person dealing with the cancer, but their spouses and their kids, everything just got turned upside down. Their schedules, one of my friends was gonna move down to San Diego, be a, a teacher at Palomar. Um, and so profound sadness and everything just kind of got rocked. And then of course there's all of the things in between. Not everybody has kids that are graduating and not everybody got news that somebody has cancer. Um, but there's the stress of work and school and struggles with weight and money matters and kids and all of that. And, what, and the reality is all of us go through all of these highs and lows and fears and anxieties and joys and success and failure. And what we hold on to is that in the midst of all of these things, that God is lovingly and and graciously watching over his people, regardless of what that is. And so whatever state of mind you may have come in this morning, what sort of a week you may have had, what sort of emotional and mental relational stuff that you've come into this morning, uh, we come into the presence of a God who loves us and he extends his arms out to us and says, come. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to stand with me for Abel for this morning's call to worship, which comes from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the numbers of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is the Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those whose hope is in, his, is in his steadfast love. Let's continue worship.
Good morning. I am not Brian Qualls, but I'll be leading you in prayer this morning. So would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, our God, we come to you today to worship you because you are our Lord and our God. When we look around at the wonders of creation we can see each day, we know that you are mighty and powerful. From the tallest mountains to the smallest atoms, we can see that you delight in reason, order, and beauty. Even the smallest infant declares your glory and how wonderfully you have made each of us. When we look at your word, we see that you are a holy God who demands justice when people reject you in sin. But we also see that you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Instead of righteously rejecting us for our sin and removing us from your presence, you draw us near, bring us to your house, and sit us at your table to enjoy intimate fellowship with you. However, we know that the meal we enjoy with you isn't free. The bread and the wine remind us of the sacrifice of Christ that you provided to take our place. Thank you for providing the lasting solution to our biggest problem. Thank you for sending your son. We deserved death in our unrighteousness, but you sent Christ to take our penalty, suffer in our place, and to give us his righteousness. Your care is not limited to our spiritual needs and our salvation. We know that you also care for our daily needs. You care for us more than the birds of the air and the grass of the field. You feed them and you clothe them, and yet we worry. We confess that we are often anxious and afraid. Despite what you have told us and continuously show us about yourself, we confess that we often doubt your goodness and provision, and then we try to find ways to provide for ourselves. We may not seek out uh, pagan leaders or create idols and images and seek their favor, but we do seek our own solutions. We forget you, and we rely on our own strength and wisdom until it fails us. Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your strong arm of protection and guidance. We need your mercy, and we need to be saved from our self-reliance. We come to you because you are merciful. We thank you for showing us your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that empowers us and enables us to live a life that is pleasing to you. Help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us to love our enemies. Because of our sin and our own brokenness, our enemies are often our friends or family. Help us to love those who often inspire the most anger. Rather than lashing out at them, help us to respond with gentleness and love. Enable us to love our enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Bless those who curse us and pray for those who abuse us. Help us to glorify you in all we say and do, especially in those times of conflict with those closest to us. We ask that you would be with those who are sick, those who are ill now for a time, as well as those who suffer each and every day. Give them your strength, and if it be in your will, we ask that you would heal them. Be with their doctors and other medical professionals and give them wisdom as they care for their patients. Be with those who cannot be with us to worship. Give them your comfort and peace and give them your hope. We ask that you would be with our leaders in the church and government at every level. Give them the wisdom that they need to serve the people under their care. Thank you for allowing us to worship you in peace and without fear. Be with missionaries and other congregations around the world as they bring the light of your gospel into dark and dangerous places. Please also be with the men and women who serve us daily, firefighters, police, and service men and women in the military. Be with them and keep them safe in times of trouble and comfort their families as they are away serving. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would open our eyes to the beauty and truth of your gospel. We pray that you would use it to wash us so that we can be presented to Christ, holy and blameless. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, at the sign, if you could please reach down, grab the friendship binder that are in the angled aisles. If you could pass those.
fill the information and pass it down. And once it reaches the end, please pass it back. And for family with young children at this time, if you would like, please take this time to excuse them for our optional programs of toddlers, nursery toddlers and children's church. And if you are a fir first time visitor to our church, those programs are through that open door. And so please take this time to excuse them for, for those programs. And as the binder is going around and as we prepare ourselves for God's word today, today is uh, Communion Sunday and so it's an, it's, a, it's an exciting Sunday. But I, when I saw Pastor Ted's passage, it, it, it brought me back to um, 15 years ago when I first started doing ministry. Um, God put me in a place to, do, uh, to, to be the children's ministry pastor. And all, everyone around me got very, very worried because they knew just how well I got along with human beings under the age of 18. And that's sarcasm if you're wondering if I'm being serious. No, I did not get along very well with children. So everybody was worried, including myself. I was so worried. And then I remember meditating on this passage, particularly because an older brother of mine told me to meditate upon it. And it taught me so much humility. Humility to understand what God's been, this business of the church is all about. It's not about bringing the gospel to those who are worthy or deserving, who are great, but it is for those who need Him, including myself. That's all of us. And so you please join me in singing this, this song called Humble King, and let us prepare our hearts and our minds for God's Word in singing this song together. Me down uh.
Before we get into the word this morning, just a few announcements. Uh, Vacation Bible School registration is, of course, still going on. Uh, it's op- uh, registration is open online, uh, so make sure you get your kids signed up, uh, get, uh, get your neighbors signed up, friends signed up, uh, and scholarships are available. We don't want to uh, have money be the reason, or lack of money be the reason uh, somebody doesn't come to Vacation Bible School, so know that scholarships are available. Uh, between the services today, there are two things are happening. There's an all VBS volunteer meeting. Uh, Irene, is that, or Robin, is that in here? In the sanctuary, uh, between the services. So if you're a volunteer for Vacation Bible School meeting right after the service in here. Uh, also, if you're a newcomer, Uh, We are having a newcomer reception uh, up in the house, the New Life house, just over here. Um, I'll be there. Robin will be there. Some of the staff and elders will be there. Just an opportunity for us to uh, meet you, you to meet us, and uh, learn a little bit about the church. Uh, So that's in between the services as well. Um, Are the Vanden Herricks here this morning? Second service, okay? Just so you guys know, this is their last Sunday. Uh, Mark and Allie and their children, Willem and Hannah, uh, are moving to Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, They go with our gratitude for years of faithful service. uh, And uh, they also go with our blessings and our prayers for their new life in Tennessee. Uh, I have to say, man, if if the Van and Herricks bless their new church, uh, half as much as they have blessed new life, that church is going to be very grateful uh, to the Lord for them. Uh, And then lastly, friends, just a reminder, uh, you know, some of you I know think this is my only work day. Uh, You know, say, boy, how do you get a gig like that where you only have to work once, you know, one day a week? Uh, (laughs) um, But... um, it's also your work day. Uh, so New Life members, remember, we need to be looking for people. We need to be extending a hand of welcome. Uh, and, uh, t- you know, go up to people you don't know and uh, introduce yourself and welcome them. Uh, and th- the rules of engagement here uh, give, um, g- give some um, uh, recognition to the fact that we tend to forget names. Uh, I certainly do that. Uh, So we give each other permission to ask uh, each other's names for as long as it takes for us boneheaded people to remember them. So, uh, you know, uh, what I don't want are manners and social propriety and embarrassment uh, to get in the way of us connecting and saying hello to one another. Uh, So you need to do that. Um, And uh, just a reminder, we all need to be doing that. Okay, uh, we're going to take a break from Daniel today. We're almost done with Daniel, uh, but we're taking a break from uh, that almost finished study in the Old Testament. We're going to look in Mark's gospel today and look at one particular episode in Jesus' ministry that's actually recorded by uh, all three of the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all tell, this, uh, tell about this event. Uh, And this event reveals a lot about Jesus, and it reveals a lot about you and me. Uh, The text is Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. And uh, if you don't have your Bible, it's printed for you in the bulletin. And you can follow the reading there. 
give such a short reading, and uh, I'm going to ask if you're able to please stand for the reading of the gospel. Mark 10, beginning at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, open our spiritual eyes to see and understand um, the truth truths about you and the truths about ourselves that we see here. Uh, Give us humility to accept these truths and to live by them. Um, We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've always been intrigued by this teaching of Jesus, um, and that's because I've I've tried most of my life to be so grown up, so adult, so mature. And Jesus comes along and encourages us to be like children. Uh, it's, it's intriguing. It's countercultural. So what I want to do is look at three facts that are revealed about Jesus here that not only tell us about Jesus, but in the process tell us about ourselves. We're going to look at the anger of Jesus. We're going to look at the surprise of Jesus. And then finally, we're going to look at the serious grace of Jesus. So it's the anger of Jesus, the surprise of Jesus, and then the serious grace of Jesus. First, the anger. So um, some people were bringing their children to Jesus. Think little children, right? Um, Mark uses the, the general Greek word for children But in Luke's account, Luke gives us a a, a more interesting detail, uses a more precise word that means infants. So we're talking probably mostly about very little children, young children. And in the final pronoun here in verse 13, where it says the disciples rebuked them, the them there, uh, in, in English, we can't tell if that's referring to men, women, both, uh, in Greek, it's, it's um, masculine. That's a masculine uh, pronoun. So this, uh, the picture here is unlike how it off, the, this event often gets depicted, which, uh, is, uh, w- which w- consists of mothers bringing their babies. Uh, Mark suggests here that it was fathers. Um, maybe it was just fathers. Maybe it was a mixed audience. But clearly, some fathers were bringing their infant children uh, to Jesus so that he could bless them. And what were they met with? They were met with the disciples, right, the 12, rebuking them. Another strong word, um, really meaning standing in the way, preventing, avoiding. Uh, You know, they they stood in the way of them coming, bringing their kids to Jesus, prevented them from bringing their kids kids to Jesus. And that's what made Jesus angry. And he is really angry here. Uh, This is, uh, you know, some of us don't like to imagine Jesus is angry, but he got angry. Uh, It says he was indignant. And it's a very strong word that that, that the idea is uh, it's an aroused anger at the perception of a wrong. Right? So Jesus is, has, has become angry. His anger has been aroused because he perceives that the disciples have done something seriously wrong, okay? I don't know about you. I tend to flatten my perceptions of Jesus as I, as I read the Gospels. Um, you know, it, it, uh, as I'm reading it, it all kind of blends into monotone. But Jesus was anything but monotone, right? Jesus was was full of personality. He expressed emotion frequently, sometimes strong emotions. Here, anger. Although, of course, the difference with Jesus is that his expressions of emotion were always without sin. 
Mine are frequently with sin, right? It's, it's the, the emotional outbursts that get me into trouble. Um, the, 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 the anger might be justified. The reaction often is sinfully not justifiable, right? But uh, that's not Jesus. Jesus' anger was uh, righteous. It wasn't sinful, and his expression of it wasn't sinful either. So, so we've got a very angry Jesus, and we have to ask why. I mean, what, what, what was the big deal about these children? Why was he so angry that uh, the disciples prevented these little babies from uh, coming to him? Now, well, to answer that question, we have to go to the second point, uh, which is the surprise of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking here about Jesus being surprised. I'm talking about Jesus surprising us. And to get at how he surprises us here, let, let me tell you about some American soldiers who, uh, uh, in World War II who were engaged in combat in the French countryside. Uh, their unit came uh, under fire, and after uh, one particularly intense battle, one of the American soldiers uh, in the unit was killed. Uh, his buddies didn't want to leave his body on the field, uh, and remembering a little church uh, several miles away down the road that had a small cemetery uh, connected to it, surrounded by a white fence, uh, they decided to give their buddy, if they could do it, uh, a Christian burial. And so they got the, uh, their, uh, the permission of their officers to take uh, the body of their friend to the church uh, for this burial. Uh, they, the, these guys knocked on the door. It was now the end of the day. Uh, knocked on the door. An old priest uh, answers, bent over, uh, and they explain, our friend was killed in battle. We want to give him... Um, we want to give him a Christian burial. But the old priest replied, um, I'm so sorry, he says, we can only bury those uh, of the same faith here. Right? You had to be Roman Catholic to be buried in the grounds. Um, and this dead soldier was not a Roman Catholic. Um, these, his friends, these war, now war-weary soldiers, discouraged, uh, just turned around uh, and uh, started to, to leave. But the, uh, as, as they were walking away, the priest, the old priest called out and he said, you know, you, you don't have to take him all the way back. He said, you know, you can, you can bury him here outside the fence. That would be okay. And, and cynical now and exhausted, these soldiers uh, now in the dark dug a grave outside the fence, buried their friend returned to their unit. The next day, their unit moved out, and uh, the same soldiers swung by the church to pay their respects to their uh, dead friend one last time. But strangely, they couldn't find the place where they had buried him. They were looking all around, couldn't find it. Uh, they were rushed, of course. Uh, they were tired, uh, and they were increasingly confused. So finally, they knocked on the church door one more time, same old priest answers the door, and they said, hey, we can't find where we buried our friend. Can you show us where we did that? It, they, it was really dark last night. We were exhausted, must have been disoriented. It's not, he's not where we thought he, he was. Uh, there was a pause, and the old priest looked at him, and he smiled, and he said, you know, after you left last night, I couldn't sleep. So I went outside early this morning, and I moved the fence. Isn't that a great story? Move the fence. You see, that's... The, the priest had initially done something like what the disciples were doing. The disciples were, in effect, fencing Jesus' grace. Sometimes we do that. The disciples presumed that, uh, that these infants were not, uh, were not as important to Jesus as adults, that they weren't critical to, uh, they weren't mission critical for Jesus. Uh, so they decided uh, on their own to fence these infants from 
the grace of Jesus. But this is where Jesus surprises us. This is where Jesus may make us even a little uncomfortable because what Jesus does is move the fence. Look what he says in verse 14. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now that's a remarkable statement, right? In in effect, what Jesus is saying, I'm the king in the kingdom of God. That means that I and my kingdom belong to these very children that you've been hindering. And and every child like them. The kingdom belongs to them. Speaking specifically of of the children that were brought to Jesus, well, what was special about those children? Who are these children, right? Well, again, think about the context. These are children of believers in Jesus. Now, these believing parents did not have sophisticated faith. They didn't have fully formed faith. They knew very little. They didn't know nearly as much as what you Christians know. But these parents did have enough faith to bring their children in public to Jesus for his blessing, and that was enough for Jesus. You see, Jesus' grace to believers, even believers whose faith is imperfect, whose faith is as small as a mustard seed, Jesus' grace is wide enough to embrace those believers and their children. I hope this encourages the heart of every parent here. Now, of course, we know, um, and, you know, the theologically correct among you are, are going to remind me, well, Ted, don't, we know that this doesn't mean, Jesus couldn't be teaching that you know, the children of believers are somehow automatically uh, granted salvation, Um, And I'll I'll, I'll grant that our children can ultimately forfeit this blessing, right, By 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 their settled disobedience of unbelief. But I don't want you to let the, let that truth blunt the beauty of their blessing. The blessing that they have, your children have, as, as your children, as, because you're, a, you're believing parents, right? The kingdom of God belongs to your children. That's what Jesus says. That's an incredible blessing. Right? He's, he's moved the fence. It's wider than we think it is, his grace. Um... Which gets us to that third topic, right? Uh, The serious grace of Jesus. And it's in this final sort of teaching of Jesus in this little passage where the, the teaching becomes wider, it becomes broader, and it actually shows us that Jesus doesn't actually just move the fence, he blows it down. Verse 15, Jesus goes on to say, um, and it's, and it's, uh, it begins with truly, truly I say unto you, or however it says in, in, in uh, Hebrew and Greek, it's amen, amen, I say to you. And when Jesus starts something with amen, it means pay attention. Uh, what's coming is, um, is, is important. So important, I'm giving it the amen beforehand. Um, and, uh, and then he says, whoever... Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now, that's a, that's a double-edged statement, isn't it? Um, it's, that's why I call this serious grace. Uh, Jesus expresses a, a, a wonderfully positive truth in, in the negative here. But there, so there's, there's, a, there's a wonderful positive truth truth here and there's a sobering warning here right on the one hand Jesus is saying look at anybody can be in my kingdom 
Anybody can be a citizen in my kingdom because all that's required is that you receive it like a child. That's it. That's open to anybody. On the other hand, Jesus is saying, but you can miss my kingdom. You can, you can miss it. How? If you try to enter it, if you try to gain it, uh, like an adult, which is, this is why I was intrigued by this passage and a little daunted by it. Because, like I say, you know, I pride myself in being an adult. I pride myself in, you know, in, in, in acting like an adult. And because the world and the culture where we live influences us to be adult like, not childlike. What does it mean to receive the kingdom like a child? This is what we have to do. It's important to know what it means. Well, think about it. And remember, think, think in terms of very young children, infants. You know, a, a child is unable to provide for herself, right, or himself, what it, what is, what it needs, right? Utterly unable, totally, a child is totally unable to provide for itself. Therefore, that also means that a child is utterly dependent on, on one outside, typically a parent, right, uh, for what it needs to live and what it needs to thrive. The only thing a child can do, right, uh, is receive what it cannot earn, receive what it cannot produce for itself. Right? Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, a child can also poop. Okay. I'll grant you that. But look, basically, a child is not in a position like an adult to, to, to earn something, not in a position to build a resume. All an infant can do is, is nothing. It is just receive from a parent uh, what it needs. Um, I read, in, in, as I was preparing for this sermon, I read a, a story about a, a young boy who finally wore his parents down uh, uh, asking for a puppy. And they, fi they finally relented and said, yes, you can get a puppy. He was, you know, bargaining. He said, look, I'll buy it with my own money. I've saved up my allowance. And they said, fine, okay, you can, you can buy the puppy. And so once he got that permission, this, this boy excitedly made his way to the pet store, this pet store that he would pass every day on his way to and from school, where he had been looking at a window full of uh, cute little puppies. The pet store owner, seeing a little kid come in first, makes sure that he has the money, right? Let me see your money. <laughs> and counts the kid's money. He says, yep, yep, you've got enough money for one of those puppies. And then he, he takes the boy over to the display uh, to, uh, to have him choose the puppy he wanted. And the boy stood there and watched the puppies for a long time and just studying them. Uh, and, and, and finally, he, he tells the owner, um, I think I'll take the little one in the corner. Uh, and instantly, the, uh, the, the, uh, the owner looks over, sees the one he's pointing to, and he goes, oh, no, 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 no. You don't want that one. There's something wrong with that one. Look, see, he's just sitting there. That's all he does. He just sits there. Something's wrong with one of his legs. He can't run uh, and play like the other puppies. Uh, so choose, choose another one. And this boy, without saying a word, uh, lifted his pant leg to expose a chrome brace to the owner. And he said, no, I'll take the one in the corner. You see, it turned out that what disqualified the puppy from being chosen by everybody else is what most qualified it to be chosen by that boy. And that's exactly how it is with Jesus and you and me. We are, next to Jesus, uh, like infants, weak, helpless, 
utterly dependent. We can't be good enough to earn anything from him. In fact, we continue to fall short every day of what he requires uh, of his creatures. Uh, we don't have what he requires. We can't produce it. Uh, and, and, you know, in addition to all that spiritual lack, which is the most important, we, most of us also lack the, the things of the world, the things that the world values so much, right? Fame, you know, drop-dead beauty, uh, popularity, wealth, status, power. But what Jesus is communicating here is that all of this lack in you, all of this inability, all of this utter dependence is exactly what qualifies you in Jesus' eyes. It's exactly what qualifies you to receive God's kingdom, right? Not by merit, not by reward, but by gift, by the sheer, wonderful, breathtaking grace of the Lord. Jesus loves you. Just as you are in all of your inability and dependence and unworthiness and ordinariness, he loves you. He's chosen you. So the right way, friends, indeed the only way to receive the kingdom of God is to receive it with totally empty hands from the nail-scarred hands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Mark makes this point even more clear by showing us the, op the wrong way to do it. Mark was always doing this. Uh, the, uh, the theologians call, call it a Markan sandwich, right? He would, he would show you uh, the right way, Right, And then he would show you a couple of wrong ways. That's the meat of the sandwich. And then he'd put the last piece of bread on, which is going back to show you the right way again. And that's exactly what he does here in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is a big mark and sandwich. Starting with the, the, the first lesson is if you want to receive the kingdom of God, you have to receive it like a little child. And then the very next episode shows us how not to receive it. What, what, what's that episode? It's Jesus encountering the rich young ruler right? The model adult, right? He's, he's, he's got uh, lots of money, lots of spirituality, lots of attainment, uh, lots of personal holiness. He knows his Bible. He takes its commands seriously. Uh, he completely believes that he has, uh, uh, he has sufficiently obeyed God's laws, uh, and he just wants to know, is there anything lacking? Just tell me, Jesus, what I need to do. That's the adult speaking, right? Don't tell me I, you're going to give it to me. Tell me what I need to do to earn it. And uh, so Jesus complies. He says, oh, okay. Sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Give, give the money to the poor. Now, Jesus, of course, wasn't laying out a universal rule uh, for salvation. Jesus was targeting this guy's heart and, and, and showing him how far off the mark he was, how little he was obeying God's law. He was, he was breaking the first command because why? He loved his money and he loved his possessions more than God. First command broken, right? Um, Jesus was showing him his, his utter inability to uh, get into the kingdom by himself. But this, this young adult didn't want to hear it, so he walks, he makes history. He walks away from Jesus. The only one in the Gospels that uh, walks away from Jesus, uh, rejecting his grace uh, and sad as he walks away, uh, rejecting his gift. His hands are too full too full of his own righteous, supposed righteousness, too full of his own wealth, too full of his own self-love, too full of his notion of his own self-sufficiency. He's the model adult. And then right after that, if that's not enough to show you the wrong way, we, we get uh, the lesson from two of Jesus' own disciples, James and John, right? The sons of thunder. 
That's who we call James Kwok and John Kong. <laughs> the sons of thunder, thundering around here. Um, right, they'd been arguing with the other disciples about who was the greatest. Uh, and they had decided, uh, actually, we are. Uh, we've, we've outperformed them all. Uh, we've done the best. Uh, we are the most holy, the most obedient, and therefore we deserve the power and the position that comes with our work, uh, with our holiness. Uh, we want the positions of power and prominence in Jesus' king, in your kingdom, Jesus. We, we, when you come into your kingdom, give us the seat at your right hand and at your left hand. And Jesus once again had to rebuke uh, his disciples, right? Telling him, look, it's not about power, it's not about position, it's not about performing, it's not about ruling, it's not about being super spiritual, it's about being humble, it's about being a servant, it's about realizing how dependent you are and how unable you are to, to save yourself. It's a hard lesson. And then chapter 10 closes out, you know, with that last piece of bread, which is, again, it goes back to the right way to come into God's kingdom. And, 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 and we see it uh, in, um, again, it's exactly like, the, it's, it's a lived out picture of what it is to receive the kingdom like a child. And, it's, and we see it in the example of blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Right, uh, Bartimaeus was acted just like a child. Right there, he is, and Jesus is coming into the town. Uh, he hears the crowd. He hears the people yelling, and he starts. He does what a what, what a child. What does a child do? Child cries. Right, cries out, and he starts crying out, "Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me! Son of David, have mercy on me!" And he's yelling, he's crying out, and the crowd. Gets, is getting angry, and they, they rebuke him, and they tell him to be quiet. Um, and uh, so, parents, what do, your parent, what do your children do when they want something and you tell them to uh, stop crying and be quiet? What do they sometimes do? Cry all the more, right? Mine did. And that's exactly what Bartimaeus did, like a child, right? Cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and Jesus responded to the cry of the child, right? Came over, gave him his mercy, gave him his sight, and he gained the kingdom. This is, a, you know, it's beautiful, but it's hard. It's, this is a hard lesson to learn. And I bet there are some people in here who aren't Christians who think this, this, this is just not, it's very hard to even understand, get your mind around. Um, because it really is, goes so against the grain, doesn't it? Uh, every, where you live, where you work, where you play, where you do sports, um, where you go to school, you know, it all works on the principle of, of, of merit and achievement. Resume building, right? And we're, we're constantly being pulled into that way of thinking, that way of acting in virtually every area of our life. And so we start applying it to our relationship with the Lord. We start to think we can build a resume, that we can clean up for God, that we need to perform for Him if He's going to perform for us. C.S. Lewis recognized how, how hard it was to, to keep thinking that next to God, you're, you're, you're just a little child. Um, he said it this way. He said, it's easy to acknowledge, but almost impossible to realize for long that we are only mirrors whose brightness, if we are bright, is wholly derived from the sun that shines upon us. Surely we must have a little, however little, native luminosity. You hear what Lewis is saying? Saying, it, we, okay, we can acknowledge that we're, we, we really, we're bringing nothing to the table. We're just a mirror. Any, any, any good in us, any brightness in us is wholly attributable 
to the fact that we're reflecting the, 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 the reality of, 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 of the Lord. And he, and, but, but he's saying, you know, there's something in us that wants to, to, to not admit that. It, don't we have some native luminosity? Is, you know, don't I have, you know, with this little light of mine and let it shine? Don't I contribute something to, to, to it? Uh, and Lewis says, no. So does Philip Yancey in his book, The Scandal of Forgiveness. He says, it's our destiny for now as fallen creatures made in God's image. It's our destiny for now to be imperfect, incomplete, weak, and mortal. And it's only by accepting that destiny that you and I, in Christ, escape our limitations, escape our lack, and receive grace and are drawn to God and come into his arms like the little children did here. And when we do that, Christian friends, you know, we ironically and surprisingly experience um, what Lewis described as, as, a, a, as a joy in total dependence. That there's something joyful and freeing about finally realizing and acknowledging our total dependence upon the Lord. Uh, Lewis said that it ought to make each of us a jolly beggar. Christians are jolly beggars. And of course, this table shows us why we can have that joy in total dependence, right? Because this table shows you once again, preaches to you through the bread and the wine, that, uh, that Jesus has everything you lack uh, and that Jesus did everything for you that you could not and cannot do for yourself. Uh, the bread and the wine drive home to you again the perfectly lived life of Jesus for your account. The death of Jesus as your substitute, making full and complete satisfaction for all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt for all time, past, present, and future, drawing you near to him. And, and it points you to also to the reality of future resurrection. When your lack becomes fullness, when your imperfection becomes perfection, when your cup overflows. So friends, let's, uh, let's come to the table now. Let's listen to Jesus' invitation and let's receive his kingdom like the little children we are next to him and let's come in the joy of total dependence. Okay? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're going to come to your table now um, in total dependence recognizing our dependence and our inability. Uh, Lord, thank you that you, you are the good parent who gives us all that we need. Um, may we trust in that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could ask the elders who are going to serve to come on up while they're coming up, I'll read to you from Matthew's Gospel. It says, Now as they were eating, this, this, the disciples with Jesus. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So, uh, as one uh, theologian I read said, the kingdom is not an exclusive, well-trimmed suburb with snobbish rules about who can live there. No, it's, it is for a far larger, homelier, less self-conscious cast of people who understand that they are sinners because they've experienced the yaw and pitch of moral struggle. Uh, and we all have, you know. And I think if, if you're not a Christian here today, right, don't, you, there are warnings in Scripture about coming to the table. And I, and I realize that you might not want to come to this table because you're having a hard time admitting what Jesus is saying here about you and me, uh, that we are uh, 
totally dependent, that we aren't sufficient in ourselves, that we, that we're, that we, we aren't, that the rich young ruler isn't enough, right? Um, but you know, people are finding it out. I was listening to a TED talk the other day. It was fascinating. It was, uh, they were doing these studies about children and how we respond to children. And it says that we have uh, sort of a built-in compassion mechanism that responds to the cry of children, not just our own children, but, but any child. And there are actually, there are, there, are, there are emotional and mental and physiological effects that, that our chests actually get larger. Who knew, right? Some nerve expands as we process the cry of a child. Now, the speaker went on to explain, this is, this is because of evolution, right? Uh, we, we, you know, the, the, we know that you know, our survival as a species depends upon the survival of the next generation. So, of course, we have been hardwired through evolution to respond compassionately to the cries of children so that you know, we will uh, have a surviving next generation. But, th thankfully, the, the speaker had the honesty to admit that, you know, it's not all real rosy. Because in addition to this compassion, we are, we are also finding out that, that you know, this, there's an undeniable reality that even the most compassionate people have a built-in capacity for evil, right? To think it and to do it. And of course, we're seeing that writ large in our, uh, in our culture today. Uh, we do, friends, and that's, that, that's, that's why we are not enough. That's why we need the forgiveness uh, of Jesus. That's why we need his mercy and why we can't earn it. We are not uh, sufficient in ourselves. There's that built-in warping uh, of a propensity for evil. So, Christian, whatever your failings may be, uh, you need not lower your eyes in the presence of Jesus this morning, okay? Um, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are the joy of your Heavenly Father. If you're not a Christian here, uh, please, please consider uh, yourself. Look in your own heart, see what's there, and then look out to your heart to Jesus and what he says. Whoever will receive my kingdom like a child will enter it, stated positively. Do that. Um, so if you're, if you're a member of this church uh, in good standing, you can come. If you're a member of any Christian church where the gospel is faithfully preached and you're not under the discipline of the elders, uh, then you can come. If you're in a church that doesn't have membership, then uh, as long as you're faithfully attending there and, and, and you're not under the discipline of the elders, you can come. This is not Lou Life's table, not Ted's table. This is the table of Jesus, the one who has everything we need and has done everything that we can't do. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we're going to eat this meal now. Help us as we eat it by your spirit to uh, really commune with you. That's why we call it communion, Father. We, we want you to communicate to us as we now if we've heard the gospel and now we're going to actually eat and drink the gospel. So as we handle and taste and touch uh, and smell these elements, Lord, drive home to us uh, your reality, uh, your goodness, your, your work on our behalf um, and uh, comfort us and encourage us in the faith, strengthen us in the faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this uh, body, uh, this bread is my body, which is for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. The elders are going to pass out the bread now. Uh, please take a piece, hold it. Uh, I'll then serve the elders, and then we'll all, all eat together. Thanks. Tells of his love in the 
only one song I can sing When in His beauty I see the great King This shall my song in eternity be you hold in your hand represents the body of Jesus. Jesus said it's for you. Uh, So take and eat in remembrance of Jesus. Let's eat together. And then Jesus took the cup, said this cup is the new covenant, the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you in remembrance of me. We're to pass out the wine now. In each tray, there's wine and grape juice. The grape juice is in the purple cups on the outside ring. That's grape juice. Wine is in the clear cups. Um, same like the bread. Take it, hold it. I'll serve, th- serve the men. We'll uh, then drink it together. Thank you. a place where mercy reigns and never dies well, there's a place where streams of grace flows deep and wide and all the like a flood comes flowing down at the cross and the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I
Christian, as I said, Christians, uh, whatever your failings may be, you need not lower your eyes in the presence of Jesus um, because we're covered in the blood. Right? This is proof that you're loved, that you're forgiveness, uh, that you're forgiven, and that you are the joy of our Father in heaven. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Father, thank you for communing with us through uh, these common elements um, that remind us uh, that you are not only God, but you are also man, that you came to us um, suffered for us and know what we are going through know what we are experiencing that you are now our merciful and faithful high priest that we can come to and find mercy and find grace to help in our time of need thank you for that um, as we go out from here strengthened by, by your gospel be with us by your spirit that we might please you more and more in Jesus name amen Last thing we do at, at New Life in worship is the offering. If you're a guest today, uh, newcomer, uh, there's no obligation to give. We're just glad you're here. Um, this, is, this is for the people that are, you know, members, uh, regular attenders of New Life committed to our, uh, our ministry here. Um, and I would remind you, we're coming into sort of the, the lean summer months. We're a little behind in our budget, so... Um, if you prayerfully consider your gifts, um, uh, that I, if you would consider that, it would be appreciated. Thank you so much for all your generosity. So let's worship the Lord uh, as we give oh, out of our abundance. And there are two offering bags, I forgot. Red for the regular offering, blue for the deacon fund, right? Deacons, and, deacons are very busy and, and need, need their, their fund replenished as well. Uh, so let's worship with our giving as we sing our final song, A Thousand Hallelujahs. Cry out to worship as glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to see, but this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs. You magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours A thousand hallelujahs A thousand more For our redemption Whose resurrection means our right There is a time enough To sing of all you down But I have eternity to try Church, let's stand together and sing praise to the Lord and to the Lamb. 
praise to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King of heaven. benediction just two quick reminders again we have the VBS training here right after the service and especially in light of Pastor Ted's sermon I mean if you ever question the necessity and the importance of serving the kids I think this is a huge opportunity um, in the past we have about 200 kids we also have about 200 volunteers so it's a great event and it's an opportunity to say to the kids the kingdom of heaven is made up of boys and girls just like you. We actually have a lot to learn from them. So please consider if you've signed up or maybe you're thinking about it now, please uh, be there. And also those who aren't going to be in the training, I've been told to ask you to kindly go out to the patio or go out so that Irene can start the training immediately after. Also again, newcomers, the hardest part about the newcomers gathering is that you have to cross the parking lot and get to the house. But don't let that get in the way. Ted and I and a few of the others would love to meet you, so please head over there, okay? So with that in mind, God's people, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.